What? They want to fire who? Who? Rommel. What? The Rommel? Rommel? The Rommel? He's like the big star, like the world famous military genius. But they still want to remove him from Africa. All of them? All of them. Wow. Uh, that's sudden. Yeah. All right. See ya. January 29th, 1943. We've seen disagreement and often confusion among Allied High Command with with different war aims or short-term goals clashing, even differing ideologies. Well, this week, they make a stab at fixing that. This week, they get their priorities in order. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Soviets continued trying to liquidate the Stalingrad pocket, though they succeeded in destroying the Germans trapped at Veliki Luki. Soviet attacks from Voronezh down to the Caucasus continued and continued taking territory everywhere. The Japanese were pushed back on both New Guinea and Guadalcanal. The Casablanca Conference was still in progress in North Africa, and in Tunisia, the Axis attacked into the Useltia Valley. The fighting there continues as this week begins, though it stops the 24th with the German lines seven or eight kilometers west of where they were a week ago. The Americans take over 200 casualties, but the French are the real losers here, with over 3,000 POWs lost. A big problem has been that Henri Giraud has refused to integrate the French into the Allied command structure. But after this, he agrees to allow Allied commander Dwight Eisenhower to give Kenneth Anderson command of the entire Tunisian front, British, French, and American troops alike. This means that Lloyd Friedenahl's 32,000 men of Second Corps will join the 67,000 British and Americans already in First Army. Until the drive to Tunis can be resumed once the ground is dry, Second Corps is to play defense on the Allied right flank, and First Armored Division is to be a concentrated mobile reserve. Or is it? Because Eisenhower then authorizes some of the armor to reinforce the valley, and Friedenahl sends others to help in different raids. Instead of being well concentrated, the division was soon scattered across southern Tunisia. As in the initial planning for Satin, Eisenhower had issued ambiguous directives and then failed to ensure that his orders were properly executed. Orlando Ward, who commands First Armored, is not happy with the hands-on management from above either. He suggests an attack on Macnassi, some 150 kilometers south of Useltia, and on the railway and roadway line to Sfax. Freinanel likes the idea and it's scheduled for the 30th, but first, he wants to launch a raid on Sened Station, a little nowhere stop between Gafsa and Macnassi. Now, Ward says, Doing that would alert the Axis to their threat to Macnassi. But Friedenau wants it done anyhow, and tells Ward to knock the shit out of the Italians at Senad Station, which the Americans do the 24th at the cost of two men wounded. They then return to Gafsa. German commander Hans-Jürgen von Arnim then reinforces both Macnassi and Senad Station. He is also worried about Fayed Pass, which is pretty important to controlling central Tunisia. It's currently the last pass in the eastern dorsal that the Allies hold. Both sides now prepare for attacks next week. To the east, British 8th Army enters Tripoli the 23rd. The harbor entrance has been blocked by sunken ships and its approaches are mined. Harbor installations have been blown up as well by the evacuating Axis, so it will take time to get it into any sort of usable state. There are plenty of people who see Axis commander Erwin Rommel leaving Tripoli as a premature act, and he had been told to delay his move into Tunisia as long as possible. Both Luftwaffe boss Smiling Albert Kesselring and the Italian High Command are furious and even tell Adolf Hitler it's time for Rommel to go. But he doesn't go yet. As for Bernard Montgomery, 8th Army commander, this is a real triumph. His orders, when he was given his command, were to remove the enemy from Egypt, Cyrenaica, and Tripolitania. Well, he has now finished doing this. And something else that is finished this week in North Africa is the Casablanca Conference. I talked a bit about some decisions that were made last week. 
and two weeks ago about the plans made for future European actions, but there is more to cover. What about the plans for Asian and Pacific actions? The US Navy wants to launch a major campaign against the Caroline and Marshall Islands, but the British say no, since this would draw off as many as a million men from the European plans, not to mention all the planes and the 1.5 million tons of shipping that would be required. They also argue that if the Pacific theater is widened, then Archie Wavell won't have the boats he needs for an operation to retake Rangoon in Burma. U.S. Navy Chief Ernest King then surprises everybody by saying he'll give them the boats for that. But they still don't nail down a date for any large-scale Burma operation, which pisses off Chiang Kai-shek because he's been wanting that to take pressure off of China and maybe reopen the Burma road. U.S. Army Chief of Staff George Marshall then says ominously that if that cannot be done, then a situation might arise in the Pacific at any time that would necessitate the United States regretfully withdrawing from commitments in the European theater. The conference also publicly announces on the 24th what has really already been decided, that they will only accept the unconditional surrender of Germany, Japan, and Italy. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill had thought of maybe exempting Italy in order to maybe split it from Germany, but his cabinet would not hear of it. The decision on timing was, it would appear, greatly influenced by two factors. The uproar in both England and the United States over the deal with Darlan provided a strong motive for reassuring public opinion in both countries that this was no precedent for similar deals with any prominent Nazi or any analogous arrangements in the case of Italy or Japan. There was also a foreign or coalition policy reason, since it was now clear to Churchill and Roosevelt that a major invasion of France could not be launched in 1943, it would be well to reassure the Soviet Union that its allies were indeed in the war to the finish and had no intention of making any arrangement with an undefeated Germany. So, the order of strategic priorities that they have agreed on for 1943 is 1. Focus straight off on the U-boats and the Battle of the Atlantic. 2. Sustain the USSR with supplies. 3. Build up in Britain for an invasion of France in 1944. 4. Step up the bomber offensive against Germany. 5. Get the plans ready for the invasion of Sicily. 6. Without impairing the United Nations plans for fighting Germany in 1943, extend Pacific operations to recapture the Aleutians and attack the Marshalls and Carolines. The wording is very careful in there. And seven, which the British reluctantly agree to, plan for a Burma offensive by November 1943. Brooke notes that the British get pretty much all that they hoped for. American General Albert Wiedemeyer says the Americans have lost their shirts. Marshall has concerns that the U.S. is now committed in North Africa with no firm commitment from the British to the Burma offensive that Washington thinks is needed to keep China in the war. There have been worries, even very recently, that the Soviet Union would not be able to remain in the war. But at the moment, those worries have all evaporated with all of the latest Soviet advances, and they are still hammering the axis this week. Konstantin Rokossovsky's Don Front armies continue their assaults on the city of Stalingrad as this week begins, piercing the enemy defenses, but though Friedrich Jose Paulus's German 6th Army Western and Southwestern defenses are indeed collapsing, the North and Northwest are still intact and they still hold Gumrak Station, though its airfield is no longer usable. The next two days see very bloody fighting around Gumrak as 6th Army tries to retake the approaches to it and screen the forces that are withdrawing into Stalingrad city proper. Palace's dispatch the 24th makes special mention of how effectively the Romanian 1st Cavalry and 20th Infantry fight this day. German Don Army Group Commander Erich von Manstein writes that there is no advantage to continue to be gained from Paulus not surrendering so as to continue tying down enemy forces. But in reality, the Soviets are not able to begin withdrawing forces on a large scale from the Stalingrad area for use elsewhere until the 27th. David Glantz thinks that it really isn't until today, the 29th, that 6th Army's resistance no longer really prevents the Soviets from redeployment. Had Paulus surrendered back on the 20th 
as he wrote to Manstein he wished to, the Soviets would have had nearly 10 extra days to send all of those armies to assist the attacks in the Caucasus, towards Rostov, towards Voronezh, and who knows what that extra force would have or could have done. Anyhow, Gumrak and Opitnaya Station fall the 24th to 21st Army, and 66th Army pushes southwest of Orlovka. From the south, 57th and 64th Armies reach the center of Kuporosnoye. In the factory district in Stalingrad City, 62nd Army gains very little that day, so Vasily Chuikov orders it to go on the defensive and just wait for the other armies to break into the city. On the 25th, the Axis defenses outside the city have been basically destroyed. At the end of that day, Joseph Stalin sends a message of congratulations to all the Soviet troops in the region. Also that evening, Rokossovsky finishes his plans to wipe out the enemy in the city. He will chop them into two halves and liquidate them separately. 21st and 65th armies will attack from due west, while 62nd attacks from the east. These forces are to link up in Krasnyaptiabr village. After this, 65th, 66th, and 62nd will destroy the northern pocket, and 21st, 57th, and 64th the southern. There will be no artillery barrage to increase the surprise of the attack. The attacks go off the morning of the 26th, and already by 10 a.m., aerial observers can clearly see a smaller southern and a larger northern pocket formed in the city's defenders. By the evening, the northern pocket is in Barikadi, the tractor plant and parts of their villages. To the south, the Soviets have taken the Tsaritsa River and its bridge, but the Axis holds out on its northern shore. Paulus moves his headquarters to the Univermag department store. On the 27th, 6th Army holds its positions against all comers, artillery included, but the food supply has now been completely used up, though airdrops are attempted. The northern pocket is now under control of Karl Strecker, while Paulus himself directs operations in the south. The 28th, the Soviet Donfront's armies make progress once again. In the south, they make a bridgehead across the Tsaritsa. In the north, they cross the Moraya Machetka and Machetka rivers and establish themselves in the northwest corner of the tractor factory and the western edge of Barakadi. Today, at 10 a.m., the 6th Army report to OKH says, though they are holding Soviet thrusts, there are signs of imminent disintegration, and some units have neither ammunition or food. They are asked in return if they have located the 100 tons of cargo the Luftwaffe has dropped, but as Glantz points out, Although the answer is unknown, the fact that the question was asked indicated the existence of a serious problem. Disintegration is no longer imminent by this afternoon. It is a fact as the Soviets break through north of the Tsaritsa and west of the railroad. Six Army radios out that the collapse of the southern pocket tomorrow is likely. Ammunition and anti-tank equipment for resistance do not exist. And so the week ends in Stalingrad with the northern pocket holding out under constant attacks and the southern pocket collapsing ever more quickly. Here's an interesting quote about encirclements in war. A peculiarity of any encirclement battle is that a large fragment of the enemy's forces is able to break free almost immediately. On the front line, an enormous breach is created, which either requires a large number of reserves to be put into battle to plug the gap, or requires a consolidating front to be extended on both sides of the void that has formed. The encirclement of the 6th Army led to precisely this situation. The Axis really have needed to patch up their front for a while, and this has given the strategic initiative to the Soviets, who are launching operations similar to Operation Uranus, which trapped 6th Army in the first place. We saw the attacks that began mid-month against the Hungarian 2nd Army and the Italian Alpine Corps liquidate them as fighting forces, but this means that the right flank of the German 2nd Army has been opened up, so the Soviets waste no time in launching new attacks, a Voronezh operation. This kicks off now on the 24th by elements of the Voronezh and Bryansk fronts. The result of all these attacks this week the Southwestern Front's capture of Starobelsk, also the 24th, and the new attacks taking Voronezh the 25th and 26th, and Kastoronoye, west of Voronezh the 28th, as well as Novi Oskol the 29th, is that a chunk of German 2nd Army is cut off. In fact, all of the main forces of German Army Group B have now been routed, and a 400-kilometer gap in the Axis lines has been made from Livni down to Starobelsk. Well, already on the 21st, 
comes a plan to take the area around Kharkov and Belgorod. Joseph Stalin approves this at midnight the 23rd. This is Operation Zvezda, or Star, and is to begin next week on the 1st, and is to go to a depth of 250 kilometers. There is also an operation planned by Nikolai Vatutin's southwestern front. The Soviet forces on its right that have recently advanced don't have the best positions with regard to Manstein's army group Don that opposes them. This gave rise to the prerequisites for the liberation of the Donbass and for the encirclement of Holet and Freter Pico's army group's forces that were located there. Any withdrawal behind the lines for army group Don also put the 1st and 4th Panzer armies under threat of encirclement. Vatutin's plan came out last week on the 20th for Operation Skachok, or Gallop, to capture the Donbass and head to the Sea of Azov to surround and destroy the enemy in the Donbass and around Rostov. However, as the Southwestern Front has advanced, it has outrun its supply in some places by as much as 300 kilometers, and it doesn't have the vehicles to keep its mobile units fully supplied. Be that as it may, Skotrok begins today, the 29th, by the Soviet 6th Army around Kupiansk and the river Krasnaya. And way down in the Caucasus, Armavir is recaptured by the Soviets the 23rd and Kropotkin the 29th. The Allies are still advancing on Guadalcanal as well. On the 23rd, the 27th Infantry launches a two-pronged attack on the Japanese positions. In a day and a half, the 1st Battalion advances 7 kilometers through the jungle and captures Kokombona. The rest of the week along the coast, though, the Japanese put up a spirited fighting withdrawal. Now, on the 25th, the first mass Japanese air raid over Guadalcanal since November leaves Rabaul at 1015, 54 zeros and 18 Bettys strong. 22 more zeros join in over Buin. But the weather is terrible, and 18 zeros get detached from the formation. The planes reach Guadalcanal from 1.40 in the afternoon, and the Cactus Air Force can only scramble fewer than 20 planes into the air in response. But again, the weather is terrible and prevents any major damage from either side. And most of the Japanese aviators are even prevented from returning to Rabaul and land at Buin instead. Another raid comes the 27th, with nine Kawasaki Lilies and 74 Nakajima Oscars behind two recon planes. They meet up with nearly 30 American planes over Lunga. The Americans lose seven planes total and the Japanese six Oscars. The Lilies do bomb along the Matanikau, but with little effect. On New Guinea, Japanese attacks go off against the Australian airstrip at Wau, but it turns out that the Allies have anticipated this move and reinforced the field from Port Moresby. Today, the attacks are halted 400 meters from the end of the strip. There is also a naval battle that begins off of Guadalcanal tonight, the Battle of Rennell Island, but I will talk about that next week. For this week has come to an end. A week of Allied advances on Guadalcanal, in the Caucasus, and towards the Donbass, as well as the Axis withdrawal out of Libya. A conference ends that sums up the Allied war priorities. And in Stalingrad, what seemed impossible mere months ago, really looks like it's going to happen. Germany is going to lose an entire army to the Soviets, their largest army at that. What will the world say? What will everyone think? The Soviets, who have lost thousands and thousands of miles of land and, and men in the millions, have suddenly turned the tables and are going to destroy a German army. Those same Germans who took over all of Europe seemingly like that. It's pretty impressive. And I bet I know what Joseph Stalin is thinking now. If we can destroy one German army, Maybe we can destroy them all. Thinking of Rommel and North Africa, we did a gallery special on some of the military leaders of that theater, and you can check that special out right here. And here are the newest commissioned officers in the Time Ghost Army. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Arti Sundaram. If you don't know about the army, it is what finances all of our productions, and it is people like Arti Sundaram 
who comprise it. And you too can join the army at timegoes.tv or patreon.com and we will be able to continue to make stuff like this and like that, thanks to people like these and thanks to people like you. And do not forget to subscribe, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.